weekend. Uh, Pastor Josh today announced that he is starting on Sunday evenings at Youth Rev, a biblical worldview dynamic. Uh, I think it's amazing when you look and you do statistics and you see that in the Church of America, 6% of American Christians have a biblical worldview. Let me say that again. 6% of American Christians have a biblical worldview. And so uh, we're going to do that on our Wednesday night Bible studies. One of the things, as we've just finished and wrapped up the biblical citizenship Bible study, he kept po pointing out it's the lack of a biblical worldview. And so I, when the Hope Center girls come back on Wednesday night, I want to begin that teaching about a biblical worldview with them. But I found out this, this week on Wednesday, Carolyn let me know that you guys aren't going to be able to come back till April the 13th. Okay? So I'm doing this with intentionality. Okay? So that's like nine weeks away. Amen? So on Wednesday night, I looked at everybody here that was doing the biblical citizenship class on Wednesday night, and I said, how many of you would be interested in doing the David Barton, Rick Green, Constitution Alive Biblical Study? And everybody put their hand up. So this coming Wednesday night, we're going to start Constitution Alive. It's the Rick Green, David Barton study on the Constitution. So I encourage every one of you to come and be a part of it. If you go to Patriot Academy, if you go on your phone to Patriot Academy, you can go to find a class near you, click on that right on the home page, scroll down, find a class near you, click on that, and then there's filters. And if you put in Montana, then the, it'll show the class that's coming this Wednesday night. And if you register online, you'll get a free ebook. So if you do that, that would be awesome. Now, let me just, make a, I'm going to just say this and I'm going to move along. Okay. I heard a statement this week by Joe Biden that shows that either, either he's doing it with intentionality or he doesn't understand and know the Constitution. No, really, I'm being honest. I'm, I'm not up here to, as a preacher to run down a politician. I'm just saying I heard him make a statement that shows me that he is ignorant of the Constitution or he's doing this with intentionality because he mentioned one of the Bill of Rights, one of the first t ten amendments is the Bill of Rights, and he mentioned it, and he goes, well, this Bill of Right, this amendment, has no absolute. Okay, let me, let me give you, can I give you some Constitution real quick? Okay, in the, in the Constitution, when our founding fathers established the Constitution, a lot of people don't know this. You, you guys thought that they just went to Constitution Hall, they put it together, and they go, yep, that's it. That's not the way it happened. It had to be ratified by all 13 states. So each of our founding Fathers had to take the Constitution back to their state to get the state to agree that this would be the Constitution that they would live by. And here's the thing. Half of the state said, absolutely not. We're not signing this. Our Constitution, the state said, uh-uh, we're not going to sign it. And you know why they said that? They go, there's no Bill of Rights in there. And we're not going to sign it till you give us a Bill of Rights. And then there were states going, no, no, we don't want to give a Bill of Rights because we don't want to limit the rights of the citizenry. You have to understand that when they made our Constitution, they had just come out of a tyranny. They had just come out of governmental tyranny, and they're going, no, no, we don't want to limit our rights. So here's the thing. Watch this. The first this is called, remember that in school? The Bill of Rights is the first ten amendments. Here's something that most people don't know. Those first ten amendments, our founding fathers said that was not the federal government giving you that right. That was God giving you that right. And if the federal government doesn't give it to you, they can't take it away. It's inalienable rights. It's God-given rights you had from the moment you were born. So for a president to get up and go, oh, that can, there's no absolutes in that. That can be changed. Something wrong, buddy. Somebody doesn't know the Constitution. Amen? And so I'm encouraging every American to revisit the Constitution. I'm encouraging you guys to come on Wednesday night and be a part of that. That's a nine-week class. Sorry, ladies, on the 13th of April, week 10, okay? But then we're going to jump into biblical worldview. Amen! So I'm encouraging you, and again, I just want to encourage you, if you go to Patriot Academy and you fill out that information,
for the class. If you'll register for that class, you'll get a free uh, ebook for the class. Okay, Exodus 23, verses 20 through 30. Exodus 23, verses 20 through 30. Incredible place in Scripture about the power of God. Now, I want to point something at you right out of the get-go. When you read about this angel, do you see the scripture that says he's going to send an angel? Well, just out of, just to let you know, this is the Old Testament, but this angel is the second person of the Godhead. Okay, so this is Jesus. Amen? He says he's going to send an angel. This is the second person of the Godhead. But let's read it. Let's see what God is saying to them as they're going into the promised land. Behold, I will send an angel. Here's that place again. Where's the angel going? Before who? Yeah, isn't that awesome? I'm going to send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware. Now, th this word beware can also literally be be on guard, okay? Beware, be on guard of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him for he will not pardon your transgressions for my name is in him. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all the things that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. You shall not bow down to their gods, serve them nor do according to their works but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars so you shall serve the lord your god now i want to point something out to you about this verse real quick for 10 years when i go to my mom and dad's house and visit them when i open their refrigerator door this verse is on magnets on their refrigerator door pretty cool verse you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and water, and will take sickness away from the midst of you. Amen? You might want to put that on your refrigerator door. Amen? No one shall suffer miscarriage or be buried in your land. It will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my fear before you, and I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come, and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you, and I will send... What? Let me say, I will send what? You keep reading that because I want to say something. This was written, this is the book of Exodus. Now, Jackson, that tells me this book was written a long, 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 long time ago. Wait, how long? A long, 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 long time ago. <laughs> She's got it, man. In the 60s war, when Israel was invaded, the Syrians came in with T-74 tanks, Russian tanks. They came coming in from the north. They came into Israel. The Israeli soldiers did not know. This, this was a seven-year war. The Israeli soldiers did not know what to do as all these tanks were coming in. And all of a sudden, as they were monitoring them and watching them as they were coming over the borders into the land of Israel, all of a sudden they noticed that all of a sudden the tank crews began to jump out of their tanks and start running back to Syria. I'm not making this up, man. And later on, the Israeli army found out that hornets attacked the T-74 tanks and got into the tanks, and the crews were jumping out of the tanks and running back towards Syria because the hornets were tearing them up. Amen. See that? See that? I'll send what? Hornets. I mean, is you, have you ever been stung by a hornet? Listen, it hurts. No can of raid was going to stop these hornets. Amen. I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hittite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before you. Now listen, how many of you know the verses I've just read to you are talking a lot about victory? Amen. Right? But the next couple of verses just kind of make me go, whoa. Have you ever read the Bible and went, whoa? Look at this. I will what? Not, is it that interesting? I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts, some translations, many translations say the wild beast, 
and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Now, to me, there's a key here. There's something about this. Everybody say the first three words with me. Little by little. Say that again. Little by little. I will drive them out from before you until you have increased. A lot of translations say until you become fruitful. You've increased. You've become fruitful. And you inherit the land. Here's what I want to show you. I believe, as the Bible tells us in Corinthians, Paul the Apostle said that we use the Old Testament as our example. So a lot of things that happen in the Old Testament, in the natural, can be now applied to us today in the spiritual. Amen? And so there's something here. There's something in this portion of Scripture that can apply to us today. The first thing I want to point out is it seems like that God brings the victory and the conquest that the victory and the conquest belong to God. Amen? That God will do his part. God will bring us the victory. God will lift us up. He'll take us from the miry clay and he'll set us up on the rock to stay. That is God's part. But now watch this. The walking it out becomes my part. Amen? God will do what he's called to do. God will do what he's supposed to do god will bring me the victory and he'll grant it to me but the walking out belongs to me now verse 21 uh, we read this but i want to point this out to you again. verse 21 kind of eludes to you and i and are walking it out he says beware that again that word beware literally means be on watch or be on guard and what does he say? If you just look at this, what does he say? He says, first thing, you be aware or be on guard to obey his voice. Isn't that amazing? Last week, and I said this, you know, when I'm here, I, if, if there's a guest speaker, I get to hear them speak three times, Saturday evening and twice on Sunday. And one of my takeaways last week about the Missions Emphasis Sunday was both of the missionaries both of their wives kept eluding to the all said it about obeying the voice of the lord that was all about what obedience here we see in the word of god that he's saying listen i'm gonna be bring victory i'll even send hornets to make them flee right i'll be in fact i'll be a tear i'm sending angels to go before you isn't that amazing you're going to get the victory. You're going to see the, the salvation of God. But at the same time, he said, be aware, be on guard that you do his voice. Guys, we, if we're going to see the hand of God move in our life, then we've got to be a people that will radically obey him. Amen. Number two, it's basically the same thing. It's the opposite but he says here in this translation, he says, don't provoke the Lord. But you know what it says? Make sure you're not rebellious. What's the opposite of obedience? Rebellion. And so he's saying, be on guard, be aware that you're obeying his voice and you're not disobeying it. That you're not really allowing a heart of rebellion. Did you know that there are times in life that you can go through situations there can be stories that you have lived in your life that can literally cause a rebellion or a, or a callousness to build up towards God. The devil is really good at taking a story and changing it up to where we get calloused and we become rebellious. He's saying, make sure you obey the voice of God and make sure that your heart stays tender and you're not rebellious, amen? And then the last thing it says right here and again, I'm going to give it to you in modern day English, was make sure that you don't pick up your old sins and your old habits. That's what it's saying right there. It's saying, hey, listen, guys, obey him. Don't be rebellious. And listen, I'm going to give you victory. I'm going to prosper you. I'm going to make you fruitful. I'm going to cause you to inherit the land. But boy, howdy, obey me. Don't be rebellious. And whatever you do, don't start to pick up the old habits, the old sins. Don't you start living in secret sin. 
Now, here's the thing again. Think about it. God is saying, the conquest is mine. The victory is mine. But your part is to walk it out. Now, elbow somebody with the elbow of God. They walk it out. Amen? Now, look with me at verse 28. Exodus 23, verse 28. We're going to read these three verses again. I want you to see this because I'm telling you, about a month ago I was reading this and I just, I went, what? I just had to slow down. I'm reading, Nicole, about all this victory in God. And I, I really like the hornet part. I don't know if you were catching that, but I really like that hornet part. And I'm reading about this and all of a sudden God says, I will not drive them out. Now look at this. I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hittite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before you. I will not drive them out before you in one year now look he gives a reason he's right here given the reason lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field and I want to say it again many of the translations make sure they add the wild beasts of the field now this region of the world did you know they have lions did you know that they have leopards did you know they have different kinds of bear? I don't know about you. We got grizzlies here. And me and my son on our mountain bikes on a Sunday afternoon a couple years ago rode up on a grizzly bear. And both of us hit our brakes really quick. <laughs> I will never forget seeing that bear running down this trail and looking back and his fat was doing like this. And he was running. And my son went, Dad, what are we going to do? And I go, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. We're going to turn around and go back to the truck. And we 15 miles up in the mountains. I'm like, we turn around right now. We going back to that truck. They had lions. They have leopards. They have jackals. They have bear. Man, they've got so many wild animals. And God's saying this. Guys, I'm going to drive them out. But I'm going to do it. And this is verse 30. Little by little. Hold on, God. You could give us absolute victory right now. God, you could destroy the Hivtite, the Canaanite. You could destroy the giants in the land. You could give us absolute, complete victory. Now, it's in your grasp. It's in your power. You could do it. But God, you choose not to. This is what I wrote in, in my Bible. This is what I, I want to share with you today. It, just hear my heart. It almost seems like in life, there's a tension. I, I can't, I, I want to explain it to you best I can, but it's almost like there's this tension that we live under. And this tension is we live under having victories from God and then sometimes defeats. It, it's almost that we live under a tension of victory and sometimes discouragements. Maybe you're not there. Maybe you're like, oh, that's not me. I'm telling you in my life, there is, seems like at times that there are great victories and great mountaintop highs and then there's this tension of being discouraged and wanting to almost throw in the towel. Amen? You know what I've got in my notes right here in my Bible? This blessed place of tension, walking in the Spirit. Isn't that amazing? Even though it seems hard and even though at times it feels difficult, God's it can be a blessed place that we go to, walking in the Spirit. We may not understand all the circumstances. We may not understand all the situations. But in this place of tension, there can be a blessed place of walking in the Spirit. Can I share just a few of these with you that I believe that we can see? I'm not going to drive them out in a year. Lest the land become desolate. And the wild beasts of the field take it over. But this is how I'm going to do it. Little by little. Everybody say that with me. Little by little. Wow. This is how I'm going to do it. The first thing I want to point out in this portion of Scripture is I believe that this tension is there. I believe that this in life we experience this tension because God always wants to keep within us an attitude of gratitude. God always, listen, I, I, I didn't say this in the first service, but I, I can tell you story after story. I just, 
story after story. One of them is Joe Montana, but story after story of athletes that were so incredible. But when they have their children that are bigger, stronger, with a stronger arm, they never get to the accolades that their parent gets to because their parent was raised on the other side of the tracks. The parent had a hard, tough road to hoe, and something within having those hardships gave them a will to succeed and a will to win and a drive that the children that might, might have had it easy all their life, they don't ever get to that place. Isn't that true? Sometimes the hardships that you go through, you don't even realize they're for you to succeed into the future. Amen? God always wants us to have an attitude of gratitude. God always wants us to have a heart of thanksgiving. Let me read to you a place in the Word of God that so fits this. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 8, and we're going to look at verses 11 through 18. Deuteronomy 8, verses 11 through 18. God says, listen, I could have gave it to you on a silver platter, but that's not the way I'm doing it. And look, at, check this out. This attitude of thanksgiving, this attitude of gratitude, beware, there that word is again, be on guard, beware that you do not what, guys? You look at this. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today. Go to verse 12. Lest, now let's, let's watch this play out here. Lest when you have eaten and are full, and you have built what? Beautiful houses to dwell in. And when your herds and your flocks multiply, and what? Your silver and your gold. Remember, years ago when you were young, it wasn't as easy. Come on. Your silver and your gold are multiplying, and all that you have, what? Is multiplied. How many know this is the blessed life, right? When you're living in the blessed life, look what it says. When your heart is lifted up, forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness in which there were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water who brought water for you out of the flinty rock who fed you in the wilderness with manna which your fathers did not know that he might humble you that he might test you to do, to do you good in the end then you say in your heart beware, be on guard when you my power and the might of my hands have gained me this wealth. Look at verse 18. You ought to memorize this verse. And you shall remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. That he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you the power to be in wealth. Don't forget by his hand, he gives you the victory and the conquest. Amen? Amen? That attitude of gratitude. Look with me at Philippians. Book of Philippians chapter 4. Mm -hmm. Philippians chapter 4. Isn't it amazing? Because in Philippians chapter 4, we see that it, uh, all things are possible with God. What's the verse? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then we have another one. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That one's for, for oh, really? <laughs> Praise the Lord, Brittany. Thank you for straightening me out. Praise the Lord. You know what? That really does pump me. I mean, that's, that's fun. I love it. Okay. This is verse 4, okay? Rejoice in the Lord always. Help me, guys. Again, I say, where did he write this from? He was in prison. Paul the apostle was in prison when he wrote this. Do you know what the key word of the book of Philippians is? The key word, the word that is mentioned more than any other word in this biblical book is the word joy. Joy. Oh, so in the midst of prison, there can be rejoicing. 
Are you telling me, Pastor, today that in the midst of a dark valley, there's joy? In the midst of circumstances that seem to be difficult, somehow I can tap into the presence of God and I can have joy and I can be strengthened and I can be filled up. I'm telling you exactly that. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Verse 5. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord hand. Be, here's this key. Boy, what a word for 2021. Come on, what a word for Anxious for nothing, but in everything by what? Prayer and supplication with what? With thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. And look what it says in verse 7. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding. What's it going to do? What's that peace going to do in your life? It's going to be a guard to what? Your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Wow. That sometimes you're telling me that we have this, we still have to dwell with some of the Hivtites. We still have to dwell with some of the Jebusites. There has to be this tension that I can continue to say, God, I don't ever want to think that I arrived here on my own. Lord, I'm never going to forget you. I'm going to remember you always. Lord, I'm going to continue to have in trial, in the good times, and in the hard times, I'm going to continue to have an attitude of gratitude. Amen? Number two, look with me again, look with me again at verse 20. Verse 29. Why would there be another reason that God would not just give you absolute victory right out of the gate? Why, why, why is there this whole issue that sometimes in life, now not always, I'm telling you when I got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, it was like I was in absolute victory for a long time. Amen. I was on like cloud 9,000. Amen. <laughs> then some sooner or later I came back down to the reality. Amen. What is this dynamic that he's not going to drive them out from before you in one year? Lest the land, here's the reason, look at it again. The land become desolate and the beasts of the field become these bear, these lions, these leopards. They become too numerous for you. So I'm going to do it little by little. Let me tell you this. We got to have an attitude. The Lord knows what you share this with you. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. Real quick, Ephesians 1, 7 and 8. <clears throat> Incredible place in the Word of God to me. Incredible place. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 8. Look at this whole dynamic of His salvation. In Him, that's Jesus, we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to, what's that word? Abound. Okay. Do you know what another word for abound is? Lavish. Amen. I don't know much about, lavish, but I know this. I love snicker candy bars <laughs> Woo, with a glass of milk. It's just the most spiritual thing. Amen? And every Christmas, my kids will give me a snicker. But it's always the little teeny thing about that big. <laughs> Amen? So you pour this glass of milk and you get this little snicker that big. Okay? Now, let me explain to you what lavish means when they give you the whole bag. <laughs> Amen? When you get the whole bag with that big glass of milk, that's called lavish. Amen? 
Now think about this for a moment. Don't ask me why I just said that. How in the world do you combine? Do you know I've got to stand before God one day and he's going, you talked about salvation, you talked about redemption in the blood, and you compared it to Snicker candy bars. And I'm like, oh God, forgive me. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> I didn't say this last night. I didn't say this in the first service, so Snickers. Here's the crazy thing. The Bible tells us that God upon us and he did it in his blood and he abounded it towards you. He lavished you with his salvation. He lavished you. This is hard for me to think. I really, with, with all holiness of God, with Jesus the King of glory, to think that he lavished his blood on me. I think his blood is very precious. Come on. He lavished it. He abounded it upon me. And now look what it says here. He did it in all what? Wisdom and prudence. Can we break that down for a minute? Let's look at the word prudence for a minute. The word prudence means to be shrewd in business dealings. Come on, look at that word right there. Prudence. To be shrewd in business dealings. Uh, about a year ago, last summer, I got to go to Six Flags. It's a big theme park. I don't know if you've ever heard of Six Flags. But there's this ride, and I love to ride it. It's called Carson the Sombrero. I love to ride the Sombrero. So I looked at Colton. I go, Colton, Colton, let's go. Let's go, Colton. I like a little kid. I'm like, let's go ride the Sombrero. Let's go. And so we go to get to the Sombrero. And as we're in line to ride the Sombrero, the little work booth, the little station where you turn the ride on and turn the ride off, you're walking by it. And I noticed a sign in the workstation. Now, how many of you know that the average age of somebody that works at a place like a theme park is probably 16 to 19? I mean, the main staple of workers there are about 16 to 19. And there was a sign in this little work booth, and this is what the sign said. It says, if you're caught on your phone, you're fired. And when I saw that phone, I was like, that is awesome, which showed And I took a picture of it. Yes, I'll show it to you after church. <laughs> if you're caught on your phone, you out of here, man. <laughs> now, I want you to think. We've got some people in this church right now that own their own business. To think for a minute because the, the scale of wages have gone up. And it's been hard to hire some people. What in the world? What if... What if you were a business owner and you were now offering to pay people seventeen fifty an hour for their work? Let's think about this. There's, again, there's people own businesses in here, but everybody pretend like you own a business. And what if you said, look, I'm trying to get help. This is what your job entails. This is what it is. You get a break. You get lunch. You get a break. You can be on your phone then. Then you get two more hours. You're going to break and then... Two hours later, you're, you're quitting. You know, you know the, you know the, okay. All you got to do is do this. I'm not asking you to kill yourself. Just be faithful. Just work hard. You know, I'm not a taskmaster. And what if you, you, you hire this person? That, yeah, yeah, man, 17 now, yeah. And so you hire them, and you walk away, and 15 minutes later, they're on their phone telling everybody that they're making 17 an hour. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, remember I asked you not to be on your phone. Oh, yeah, 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 thank you, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then, then, you know, 10 minutes later, you go back and they're going like this. And you're like, hey, 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 hey. No, no, remember, I'm paying you this. I need this, this truck loaded and I need you to get this done. Would you? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I'm just excited. And so you leave and you come back and they're on their phone again. And you're like, hey, could you put the phone up, right? And so then you come back and you can't find them and you're looking for them and you notice the men's bathroom door is closed. <laughs> you can hear the fan on. 30 minutes later, they're still in there. Can you get off your phone? Come out to work. Come on. Come on, how many of you would keep an employee like that? How many of you wouldn't work that person very long? Look, I don't think this is working. Come on, right? If you're shelling out 17 work done, how long are you going to keep that person? Let's be honest. That's being prudent. How many of you think God's prudent? I mean, the God of heaven, Jesus the King of glory, is a prudent God. 
Now look at this. The Bible says that not only did he lavish his salvation and his redemption and his mercy and grace towards you in prudence, but it says he did it with wisdom. What's part of the wisdom of God? Part of the wisdom of God is he's omniscient, which means he's all-knowing. So listen, now watch this. That means that God saw the future and God saw when you would stumble. And in his prudence and his wisdom, he still lavished his salvation and his mercy and his grace on you. You know what that tells me, guys? That tells me God believes in you. Look at somebody and go, God loves you and believes in you. Killed a lot of elk with it. God loves you. God believes in you. God, in His grace and in His mercy, He saved you. Amen? Could it be that sometimes we experience victories little by little because God knows what we can handle? Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. You know, when they prayed that the sun stood still in the Bible and the sun stood still, I'm going to start praying every week that the sun would just stand still while I'm preaching. Just for about six more minutes. And just stand still. Mm, just sun stand still. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 13, 10, 13. No temptation. Everybody, if you're in your Bible and you've turned to this verse, do you see the word temptation? Write with a pencil or a pen right above that word temptation and write trial. In the Greek, it also means trial. It means a hardship that you've gone through. You follow me? No temptation, no trial has overtaken you except such what? It's common to man. We've all experienced these hardships. We've all experienced these trials. We've all experienced suffering, right? But God is what? In the midst of a temptation, in the midst of a trial, what is God? He is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to do what? Come here, Anthony. I need your help. No, really. That's okay. I had Colton do it in the last sermon. Come on, here, brother. And you're on Facebook, so there's, there could be a thousand people watching you. Okay. <laughs> Anthony, all I want you to do is stand here. As a Uni University of Montana Grizzly fan, but a Christian, okay? So, everybody, here's Anthony. He loves Jesus. Okay. Now, just stand. No, don't you leave. You're, thank you. <laughs> you yep, buddy. You got it, man. You got it. Okay, don't you move. Okay. Now, everybody look up at this verse again because I'm going somewhere with this. I'm just going to give you an, a, an analogy real quick. The Bible says, no temptation or trial has taken you, but such is common to man. But with that trial and with that temptation, when you're going through it, if you're not able to handle it, God will provide a way of escape. Do you see that? Okay, now watch this. How many of you know that in Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible talks about putting on the armor of God? And one of the things is it says, take upon you the shield of faith. Remember that? And then it says this, Nina, it says, whereby you may quench the fiery what? Darts of the devil. So here's the dynamic. I want you to understand. Anthony loves the Lord. He's serving the Lord. Yes, he likes the University of Montana. And maybe God likes Montana State better. I don't know. <clears throat> but he loves the Lord and he's worshiping the Lord. And the enemy, the devil's over here. And the Bible tells us that there are times that the enemy will fire a fiery dart at us. He will, the enemy will pull his bow back and he will put it right on one of us. Come on. That's what it says. And there are times that that enemy will let loose. And he'll fire that arrow. He'll fire that dart. There are times in your life and you never know till you make it to heaven. You will never know. There are times that the enemy fired an arrow at you, a dart at you, and 
about to hit you, God went like this, poof, and he caught it, and he went, poof. he couldn't handle that one. I will not let that arrow hit him. You know what that tells me? That tells me that when we do get hit by an arrow, that God knew that arrow would hit us. And God allowed that arrow to get by. So you know what that tells me? That when I am hit with that trial or temptation, God's looking down going, he can handle that one. That's going to make him stronger. That's going to, that is going to strengthen him to minister to other people that are going through the same thing. Come on. He's going to be a mouthpiece of deliverance and freedom when he walks out the other side of this. I have allowed this one to hit her. I have allowed this one to hit him because this arrow's not going to make him a victim. This arrow is going to make him a victor. Amen. Amen. Give him a hand clap. Just sit down. God bless you. He knows what we can handle. Amen? He knows what we can handle. And he can see the other side before we can see the other side. We don't see how we're going to get through the other side, but he can see the other side. Number three, real quick. Wow, wow. Earth, stand still. <laughs> Number three. I believe that sometimes the enemies aren't driven out of our land so quickly because he wants us to radically trust in him. Amen? He wants us to have radical trust in him. When you're going through the battle, when you see the enemy coming down the, come on, that you're going, Lord, I need your help. God, I got to trust in you. Lord, I need, how many have ever been in a business situation and you're like, Lord, I didn't expect this to happen. I didn't expect, Lord, I got to trust in you. Oh, I got to trust in you. Proverbs chapter Proverbs chapter 3, I love Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, but like this, trust in the Lord with all your what? Heart. heart. Do you see that scripture up there? Trust in the, not half your heart, but what? All. all and it says, lean not in your own understanding, but no, now come on, come on, we're American Christians. So that translation in America is, trust in the Lord, that sounds so beautiful to quote that to people, trust in the Lord. With all your heart, lean your own understanding. Come on. We can quote this verse, but when the truth hits, when the rubber hits the road, we want to try to lean in our own understanding, don't we? We want to try to figure it out ourselves. Come on. We, we want to put our trust in what we can do. I've got myself out of this mess before. I'm going to get myself out of this mess again. And God say, no, 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 no. The word says, trust in the Lord with what? all of your heart hey hey even when sometimes your heart doesn't feel like it trust in the lord with all your heart lean not in your own understanding but in always acknowledge him and he's going to direct your paths i told you guys if you haven't heard this forgive me if you've heard this two or three times forgive me to montana I had left a denomination. I had no job. I was faith. All I had was a fifth wheel travel trailer with four kids and a wife. And all I knew was God called me to Montana. I didn't even know where God had called me to in Montana when I moved here. And I asked my wife, when we pulled out of Dallas, Fort Worth, I asked my wife, I go, would you keep the kids in the car with you for just a little bit? So all the kids rode with her in a car. And as I drove that truck, I prayed from Dallas to Amarillo, Texas. That's a five-hour drive. I prayed, I prayed, I prayed in the Spirit. And I'm going to tell you something. Me and Jesus had a coming to Jesus time. What are you doing? Why am I doing this? Lord, I trust in you. Lord, I need you. I cry out to you, God. Oh, and boy, I prayed in the Spirit. Amen? we were coming into Denver, Colorado, the snow started coming down. Boy, the snow was coming down heavy. It was coming down heavier. I called my mom on the phone. I said, sweetie, by that she had a couple of kids in the car with her and I had kids in the truck with me. And I said, sweetie, stay on. Now, I said, we, uh, we were in Denver, but we 
this snow. I, I, I blizzard coming. We got to keep moving. Stay on. Stay behind you. We made it through Denver. We made it through Fort Collins, Colorado. By the time we get to Fort Collins, Colorado, you can't see from here to the front doors of the church. The snow's coming down so hard. The traffic's slowing down. And we finally make it to the, the Colorado state line. And we're coming into Wyoming. And there's a I didn't know it till this trip, but th there's a grade. There's a gradual climb from the state line all the way to the city of Cheyenne. There's this gradual climb for about 10 miles. And all of a sudden, the traffic started backing up. And I, and I came to a stop on the highway, man, in a blizzard. I'm at a complete stop. And, and then the, the traffic starts moving forward. And I put the truck back in gear. And when I let off the clutch, the tires start spinning like this. And so I put it. I put it down in four-wheel drive, and I start to go, and the truck starts to head forward, and I'm, thank God, thank God. And I look in my rearview mirror, and my wife's van with a little U-Haul trailer and my kids are in the middle of the highway, and she's stuck. She's not going anywhere. And I get about 100 yards up the road, and I pull over, and I get out of the truck, and I tell the baby, I say, you watch the baby. Colton was a baby back then. I go, you watch the baby. I'm going back to mama. And as I'm running down the side of the highway back towards my wife, and the van in the middle of the highway, I'll never but in the midst of this snowstorm, I see a red semi-diesel truck blow right through the snow and almost collide in the back of my wife's van and kill her and the kids. And this truck driver jerks the wheel like that. And I see this whole semi-truck and trailer come over like this and almost turn over to barely miss her. Oh my God. And I'm running down the highway. I'm trying to help her. I'm trying to stop what's going on. I'm trying to get behind her to try in the middle of a blizzard to stop cars and listen. I'm going to do this when I get home today. But that day, your pastor caused a national traffic jam. <laughs> not making it up. That night in a hotel room in Cheyenne, Wyoming, I watched the national nightly news. And on every station it said, major traffic jam in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Traffic on I-25 is backed up to Fort Collins. And I caused it. I caused it. Can I tell you something? I sat in a hotel room in Cheyenne, Wyoming for three days, stuck in a blizzard. For three days. It cost $300 to have that car towed to that hotel about four miles down the highway. And I sat there and I said, God, I prayed. I asked you to help me. I asked you to get me through this. Lord, I was trusting in you and I still am trusting in you. But Lord... I have been broke down. I have caused a major traffic blow up in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And I've, I'm trying to go pastor. I'm trying to go build a church. I'm trying to obey you. God, where are you? God, it feels like you're a thousand miles from me right now. But you know what? He was right there. He will never leave you, and he'll never forsake you. And you know what the Word of God says in Matthew? Lo, I will be you always, with you always, even to the ends of the world. When you are in a blizzard in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and you have caused a 50-mile traffic jam, <laughs> God will be right there with you. Even when you don't feel like he's there with you, he'll be there with you. Amen? There's this situation because God wants us to radically trust in him. Look what Psalms chapter 9, verses 9 and 10 say. Look at this. Psalms chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. This spiritual tension that's always there. And those... What, what's it say right here? Oh, well, the Lord will also be, with, be a refuge for who? Who's he going to be a refuge for? A refuge in time of what? Even when you don't feel like in that troubled time that he's there. He's there. Come on. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not what? Forsaken those who seek. Let me tell you a story. When I was a little boy, I was raised in the Nazarene church. And as a little boy, I, I remember hearing a story of a the missionary told. And I was, I was a little boy. I, 
I, I remember it, but it stood out to me. But this missionary said, I had a backpack on and I had medical supplies. I had medicine to get to a little village somewhere in the remote part of Africa. And he said, I was trusting in God and I was trying to get the medical supplies to the people. He said, it was hot. I was tired. I would not quit. I, it was like a backpack hike, man, for miles and miles. I would not stop. I had to get the med medical supplies to those people. They needed it. They needed Jesus. They needed help. And he said, I made it all the way to the river. And when I got to the river, I, I realized it was the time of year that the river was swollen and the waters were torrential going down the river. And I, there was no way I could cross. This missionary said, I got on my knees and I closed my eyes and I said, God, I need your help. I don't know what to do. Lord, everything within me is gone. I am so weary. But Lord, I cannot cross this river. Lord, you know the need. Lord, I need a miracle. And while this missionary was on his knees with his eyes shut, he said that he could hear the water rushing through his left ear. And he said as he was crying out to God for a miracle, he began to notice that the water was now rushing on his right side of his ear, right over here. And he opened up his eyes and he looked and he was on the other side of the river. God had moved him from one side of the river to the other. Listen, if he can do it in the book of Acts at Azotos, he can do it for a missionary bringing medical supplies to a village in need. What he's needing is a dynamic attention, attention in our lives that keep us trusting and calling out on the Lord. Amen? Number four, I'm going to close. Ushers, if you'd make your way, if we're going to take communion. I don't know. I, I, I'm not the, I, I don't know who does the usher stuff. I just preach here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm really being serious. Real quick. He wants us to have an attitude of gratitude. He knows what we can handle. He wants us to radically trust in the Lord. You know what else he wants us to do? He wants us to walk in his spirit. He wants us to really walk in his spirit. Listen to me. While they're handing out communion, I want you to look at Romans chapter verse 14. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons and daughters. Romans 8, 14. Robert, Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons and the daughters of God. The word led in the Greek, some of you may want to write this down, but the word led literally is the Greek word ago, A-G-O in, in English letters, ago. And it literally means to guide, to be driven, and it means a reflex. God wants you and I to get to a place that we walk in his spirit and we obey his voice like just like a reflex, like the blink of an eye. Amen? But look with me at verse 13 real quick. As many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons or the daughters of God. But look at verse 13 and look what it says in verse 13. If you're late and you leave here late, don't blame me, blame, blame Robert, Okay. It's not because I preach long. It's okay. Now I'm messing with you. <laughs> For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Then verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons and daughters. The reason I say sons and daughters is the word son is generic neutral. Okay, so it means sons and daughters. You know what these two verses show me? That walking in the Spirit is your choice. You can choose to walk in the flesh or you can choose to walk in the Spirit. It's up to you. Amen? Go, go to Galatians chapter 5. This time we don't have to read it backwards. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. Another place in the Bible talking about walking in the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you, not, you do not do the things that you wish. Here it is again. 
But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law or religion. Thank you, brother. See that? God, God says, I desire you in the midst of this to walk in the Spirit. But the choice is up to you. Isn't that amazing? Now we're going to read one other verse and we're going to take communion. I want to show this to you as we close because I believe this is a word directly for many of you in this room. Exodus chapter 23, verse 20. It's the first verse I read today. It's the first verse I read today. But I want to highlight something to you that the Lord highlighted to me. Exodus 23, 20. Everybody see that? Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way. Now, this is the word. This is what the Lord highlighted to me. To bring you into a place which I have prepared for you. Let me say that again. The Lord wants to bring you into a place that he's already prepared for you. The Lord, listen, little by little. Some of you in here right now you might still be struggling with temptation. And you know what the Lord's saying? Make little by little. Little by little. I'm not driving by there anymore. I'm not going down that road. I'm not going into that neighborhood. Little by little. Little by little. You know what? We're going to start reading the Word of God every night before we go to bed. It may not be more than a chapter, but we're going to get in the Word every night, and we're going to say a five-minute prayer. Come on, little by little. Listen, last week, Toby McGill said, God asked me to give him all my spare time. I didn't know how I was going to pray two and a half hours, but that's not the way it started for him. It was little by little. Wait a minute. Some of you in here, you're not struggling with temptation. You just don't know how to walk in the prophetic yet. And so you know what the Lord's saying? It's little by little. When you're walking into Safeway, just say, Holy Spirit, do you want to highlight somebody, someone for me to pray for today? You know what? You'll say something like that. You'll say, Holy Spirit, if you just want to, if you're, if you're and you'll be, in the, you'll be pushing your bag, and all of a sudden somebody will drop the potatoes, and they'll fall right out of the bag. The, just a big old tear will happen, and you'll go, here, let me help you. And you start helping with it. And once you give them to her and they think you go, hey, listen, you know, could I just pray with you today before? Really? I've been going through this. Little by little. Pastor, I'm scared to talk to somebody like that. I'm scared to go to somebody and speak a prophetic word into their life in a safe way. Okay, do it at Walmart. No, but. <laughs> no. Listen, Holy Spirit, I want to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Lord, let me pray for my husband. Hello. Lord, stir something up where I can give my own daughter a word. Come on. It doesn't have to be a stranger at a store. Hey, it's, listen, it's little by little. To bring you to a place which I have prepared for you. Amen? God wants to bring you to a place that he's prepared for you. Can I say this to you before we take communion? Fulfill your purpose. Make up your mind you're going to fulfill your purpose. Fulfill your destiny. Fulfill your destiny today. Don't you let the devil hold you back from your purpose and your destiny. You make up your mind today. It may not be a big leap. Come on. It may not be big leap it's just by little all you men that used to work out and lift weights in football you don't add 45 pounds on each side when you're trying to get a max you just when you start increasing that's why they make a little two and a half pounds <laughs> come on right right you don't go whoa i barely could get that one up throw 90 more pounds on there for me it's not the way you do it do you can get up. I think you could add some more. It's a two and a half pound on each side. In fact, I've seen one and a half pounders. Amen? Little by little by little. Amen? Let's take communion. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. It's one of the main places in communion. And it says that during this time of communion, this is what it says. It says, let 
let each man, let each woman examine their heart. So would you just bow your head with me right now? And would you just begin to examine your heart right now? M maybe, maybe today you're the person that I said, beware, be on guard that you become rebellious. And when I said sometimes you can become rebellious from circumstances and situations that have happened to you in life, maybe that's you and you're saying, Lord, I repent for that right now. Lord, I repent for that. I'm examining my heart and I repent of that. Maybe you're here today and, and he said, be aware, make sure you obey the voice of the Lord. Don't you pick up your past sins. Don't you pick up your old idols. Maybe you're here and you've said, you know, I've picked up some old idols of late and Lord, I repent of it right now. I'm examining my heart. I'm asking for this blood to cleanse me. Guys, do you realize, I, I want to say this again. Everybody look at me real quick. I'm not trying to just keep preaching at you and, and for you to be here for a long time, but, but you understand what communion means. You understand that a young man would see a young woman in Israel and he would want to marry her. And so he would bring a dowry. He would bring what they call a ransom of money to the girl's daddy. And he'd go, do I have your permission to marry your daughter? And if the he would give that money to the daddy as what is called a ransom then the young man the young lady knew what was about to happen the young man would go to that house and he would sit her and she would be seated in, across from him he would lay down a little glass and he'd pour a little wine in it and he would slide the glass to the young woman and if the young woman took the cup and she partook of it she was saying, yes, I will be in covenant to you and I will marry you. And as soon as she would say yes, by taking a drink of the cup, the young man would stand up and go, I go to prepare a place for you. The young man would then go back to his father's house and he would build a bridal chamber. He would build a honeymoon suite on his father's house. But the Bible tells us that the father was the inspector of the job. He was the general contractor. And so the young man, we know the young man would throw up a wall like we've got over there and throw a tarp over and say, Daddy, I'm done. I'm ready to go get my bride. <laughs> but the daddy would go, no, you're not done. You've got a long way to go, son. And that's why it's not for me to know the time nor the season the father comes and sends me. But it is in the hands of the father. So that's why it's so important that when we take communion and we remember the Lord, that we examine our heart, that we make sure that we're making this covenant with a pure heart. Amen? Bow your heads all over this place. Father, we come to you and we love you. And Lord, we know the blood, that blood, that redemptive work, that grace and that mercy that you abounded towards us in wisdom and in prudence, Lord, you've given to us. But Lord, we ask, cleanse our hearts, wash us, Lord, some of us, we've picked up some idols. Lord, we throw them down right now at the foot of the cross. Lord, we throw them down. We say, Jesus, cleanse our hearts. Wash us in the blood of the Lamb. Cleanse us today of pure in the name of Jesus. Jesus. This is the symbol of the body of the Lord. When you partake it, partake healing into your body. Amen. Brother Norm, would you pray over this symbol of the body of the Lord? Hallelujah. Let's partake of the symbol of the body of the Lord. And if you need healing, would you just begin to say, Lord, I, I, I speak healing over my body now. Let's partake. By your stripes, Jesus, we are healed. We are whole. And by your blood, we are forgiven. By your blood, we are washed. And we thank you for the blood. We thank you for the blood. Let's partake. In your own words, in your own way, can you just thank the Lord right now? Lord, we thank you. We love you. We ask you, Lord God, now mercy that we would step into mercy. Father, that you have gone before us. Lord, you've prepared a place for us. And now, Father, I pray that we would be fruitful and we would inherit our land in Jesus' name. Stand with me all over this place and give somebody a big Holy Ghost hug. Can you give somebody a big old, a big old 
Holy Ghost hug. Yeah, not big old, it's a big O. Big O, Holy Ghost hug. Amen. God bless you guys. If you need prayer for anything, come on up to the front.